Optimal health for high performers. This is the Health Upgrade Podcast with Dr. Nawaz Habib. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the Health Upgrade Podcast. I'm here with JP today. How are you, JP? I'm doing really well. Thank you. Amazing. You've been in a bit of a research hibernation process for the last little bit, which is really exciting. And I always love our conversations when we get talking about things that you've been researching. Well, thanks. I have been a little bit. You're right. So today our topic is going to be on epigenetics and the use of vagus nerve stimulation and how vagus nerve is involved in the actual production of our genetic transcription and transcription factors and how vagus nerve stimulation plays a role in epigenetics. And we know that this is a pretty exciting topic right now in the world that we're understanding that things are a little bit different than we initially thought, that it may not be that your DNA is coded and that's the end of your kind of how your body's going to produce proteins and enzymes and that's it, right? We know that there is a genetic piece to the puzzle. There's no question about that. But epigenetics is a whole new branch of this. And so for those who don't fully know, JP, why don't we jump in and talk about the basics of epigenetics? What is epigenetics? What does this word mean? Sure. Well, I'll give my best rendition of what Chad GPT would tell you it is. Epigenetics is, at least according to what the Google will give you, is a study of how your behavior and your environment can affect your genetic expression. So how your genes are actually expressed. It's not pure genetic changes in that, you know, there's a mutation on a gene, but it changes how much of that gene is being transcribed and translated into proteins. Doesn't change the DNA sequence typically, but it does change how your body reads the DNA and how it uses it. I like to think of it as you have a book, uh, a great book, a great novel, and then somebody says, well, we got to turn that book into a screenplay. And somebody has to rewrite that screenplay into or uh, rewrite that book into a screenplay. And then some producer says, oh, my, man, I need to get a director to make that screenplay into a movie, hires actors, hires all the rest of the team to make a movie. And that along the way, that story can change. That story can change in the hands of a different screenwriter, in the hands of a different director, in the hands of a different producer. That story can be something completely different. And so... Lots of different factors affect that. We have the genes, we have the book, that's sort of locked in, but how it ultimately forms that movie is something we got to, you know, we got to figure out and it's very complex. I think that analogy is exactly perfect, right? We've seen so many of these movies that came from source material that was the same source material, but the end product of these movies was made into completely different results in terms of what the actual screenplay and and actual movie showed up to be. And this is easily stated with the difference between Michael Keaton Batman versus Val Kilmer Batman versus Clooney Batman versus Affleck Batman versus, I'll name them all off at some point, but all of the Batmans are a little bit different, right? All of the stories behind the Batmans are a little bit different, but the source material for Batman is often almost exactly the same in those comic books from DC. So I love that point that the source material, the story, the DNA is the same, but what results is going to be different. And it's because of interpretation and it's because of perspective, different perspectives, different experiences trigger changes in how that initial source material is read and interpreted. And that's what epigenetics truly is, is the different interpretation of the same story based on lived experience by the individual. Right. And And the fascinating thing is that those changes can actually be passed on to your children and to your grandchildren. This is the basis of intergenerational trauma. That's one of the ways that we explain how something that happened to your grandparents that was very stressful, and it doesn't have to be trauma, it can be just the challenges of their living, made them different in ways that can actually be inherited. It didn't change their genes, but it changed the way that their genes are expressed in a way that's actually inheritable. And you know, to go back a couple hundred years, one of the very first descriptions of inheritance 
was written by or created by a man named Lamarck. And his famous way of describing inheritance was with a giraffe. He said, you know, food was on high branches and the earliest giraffes didn't have long necks. They just stretched their necks to reach the food. And that as a result of stretching, they became longer. And then their children inherited the the stretching, if you will, of the neck. I know that there's people out there who understand Mendelian genetics and Darwin, and they're just sort of shaking in their seats about the fact that, boy, that was really wrong. But, you know, it's funny because even though that idea has been vilified for, you know, centuries at this point after Darwin, it's coming back around as, no, it's not right, but there is a flavor of it that is right, and it's through epigenetics. So there are ways in which the things that you do and the things that you experience and the thing, the environment that you live in change how your genes are expressed in a way that your children and your grandchildren will experience as well. Um, it does fade out, and it's interesting why it fades out, because environments change, situations change. And so you want to remain flexible. But the mechanisms of how it works is, I think, fascinating. I think we'll get a chance to talk a little bit about it. Yeah, absolutely. Why don't we start to talk a little bit about that initial understanding the Mendelian pieces and how does DNA become protein? And let's go through that initial process just as the basics to set the stage for what we want to then talk about, which is epigenetics and the different factors that influence the reading of that story in a different way. Sure. And without going into the details of what DNA is and what the structures are and the chemistry, I think most people have a pretty good idea that DNA is a double helix. It carries a code. The code is made up of four letters. It's A, G, C, and T. And those letters correspond to nucleotides. We we talk about DNA being made up of nucleotides. Long stretches of DNA are coded or have codes in them that ultimately are going to be the instruction manual, if you will, for making proteins. The first thing that happens is you have to unzip that double helix. So the DNA has to be freed from its storage, and we'll talk about how DNA is stored, but you have to free it from its storage, and then you have to open up that double helix. And then there's a protein or protein complex called polymerase. It will actually copy like a like a Xerox machine or a photocopy machine, it will copy the DNA, but only one side of it. And it creates something called RNA or ribonucleic acid. It's like DNA, except it only has one side of it. Now that RNA might be modified a little bit along the way. There's proteins that come off and clip certain sections of it out or off and things like that. But ultimately, To a large extent, that RNA sequence is then exported from the nucleus into the cell, into the cytosol, where it's grabbed by other proteins and brought to the factory where that RNA is used to create protein. And there's a whole process of bringing in amino acids and reading the RNA in three nucleotide chunks or called codons, and you build this it's almost like a necklace, if you will. It's like a pearl necklace of individual amino acids that then once it's complete, will fold up on itself and become a protein. So in a nutshell, you've got DNA that's transcribed into RNA and then translated by the ribosome into a protein. And that's sort of the canonical sequence. You go from DNA to RNA to protein. There are ways to go the other direction. You can turn RNA back into DNA. And that was something that was a big deal when HIV was discovered, that it, you could take an RNA and turn it back into DNA. You just need a protein called reverse transcriptase that will do that. But we're not going to really talk about go, going the other way. We're going to stick with the pathway of DNA to RNA to proteins, because that's typically what happens in cells. Yeah, that's the basic process of all genetic biology, right? We understand that all our cells contain a nucleus, that nucleus contains the DNA, which contains the blueprint, the code, the basic manual for what proteins and the types of proteins that our body will likely need at some point. And then the simplest way to kind of put this is each of these codes or these big booklets or manuals has different chapters and different sections. And each one of our cells will utilize different sections of that manual or book to code for the particular proteins that are necessary to be coded for by that type of cell. 
So let's say, for example, it's a hepatocyte, a liver cell. That liver cell likely has specific things that it's necessary to be able to produce certain proteins, things like glutathione, things like any of the cytochrome P450 genes that are required for the detoxification process. The liver has to have uh, those pages or that, those sections of the book open, but it likely doesn't need the sections open that are required for bone production, right? The osteoblasts are not the same or osteoclasts or whatever. They're not the same as the hepatocytes. Bone cells have different sections open that are required for the production of bone, for laying down calcium, for ensuring that magnesium and calcium stay within the matrix of the bone versus a liver cell versus every other cell in our body. So the different sections of that manual are being utilized by the different types of cells. So each one of our cells then has transcription factors that come in and dictate which section of the book is open in that type of cell. And that can affect the epigenetics. That can affect which sections, which pages are read based on that person and then translated into that protein. So let's talk a little bit about some of the factors or some of the mechanisms by which transcription initially occurs from DNA to RNA. Sure. So in order to really understand that, you have to understand the structure of DNA. DNA in a human cell is 3 billion base pairs long. I mean, if you were literally to stretch out that DNA into a long strand that's just, you know, just straight, uh, straight reading it, not curled up on itself, it's almost two meters long. I mean, it's just, you know, tall as, well, I'm a little taller than that, but about that height. But in the cell, it's wound up on itself down to the point where it's only 90 microns in size. So it's just a factor of millions times smaller. So what we need to do is figure out and understand how that happens. Well, the first thing is the helix itself is winding. So it's like a telephone wire. It sort of slink. It's like a slinky comes in on itself. But You're then speaking like 1990s, 2000s telephone <laughs> cord, not charging cables for your cell phones. We're talking yes. the curly. I'm dating wires. myself for sure. <laughs> I'm dating myself for sure. Yes, a spiral, a slinky. And when you take that slinky of DNA, it then is wrapped around itself around some proteins that are called histones. So think of them like spools of thread. The DNA is already in a spiral, but now it encircles these proteins. And these proteins cluster together, these histones cluster together to form what's called chromatin. And so you have this chromatin structure that's very tightly wound. And that's how you get, if people have seen pictures, electron microscopic pictures of chromosomes, you see the chromatin structure of chromosomes, which is DNA, in this like, the X structure that they sort of have, or the Y structure of the chromosome. Now, in that structure, the DNA is too wrapped up to be read. It's too tightly wound. So you have to figure out at some ways of unwinding the section of the DNA that needs to be read. And so there's special, as you talked about, proteins that come in and enhance the transcription or promote the transcription of that DNA. And there's actually sequences within the DNA that aren't coding for a gene. They're just coding for promotion or amplification of that gene. And sometimes that gene is so important that you can't let it be wrapped up again. It has to remain out exposed at all times. There are structures within the DNA and proteins that will bind to the DNA and hold it open so it can't rewind up. But generally, you have your DNA wound around these histones to form the chromatin structure, to sit in chromosomes that are small enough to sit inside your nucleus and not stretched out to be six feet long. So that's the first step. Now, as we talked about, once you, and I know the terms transcription and translation are really close. So I like to use the terms rewritten much like taking that book and rewriting it into a screenplay and then producing, because that's what we're doing. We're taking the code of RNA and producing a protein. So we're going to use the terms interchangeably. Sometimes I'll say transcription. Sometimes I'll say rewritten. And sometimes I'll say translation. And what I mean is producing. So what happens is, as we said, you've got the DNA. It's now has to be exposed. It has to be unzipped and copied and that rewritten section of RNA then has to be translated or moved out of the nucleus and 
translated or produced into a protein. Now, the question is, how does the cell, because you described a cell like a hepatocyte or an osteoblast, how does that cell know which of the proteins that it has the capability of producing that actually it needs to produce? And this is really important because this is where the environment comes into play. This is where specialization comes into play because you can imagine that that very first cell, that very first fertilized egg that was you back when you were conceived had pluripotent, which means total potency, total power. It had the ability to create any one of the proteins necessary that are in that genome. But a hepatocyte doesn't need that. In fact, 75% of the genes on average, a cell doesn't need to ever make. Some of those proteins, some of those genes are only expressed during development, during in utero development, during pregnancy. Some of them only just for a few days of pregnancy. So those genes need to be wound up into that chromatin tightly and never exposed again. The way that cells differentiate as they go from that pluripotent stem cell at the very beginning when you were conceived all the way through to adulthood where basically all the cells are what are referred to as terminally differentiated. They've differentiated down to the point where they're not going to differentiate anymore. They're just going to do their job. Okay. A skin cell, a hepatocyte, a nerve cell, you know, in your retina, you know, any one of those things are terminally differentiated. At that point, they've ceased needing to express those other proteins. And so what the cell does, it has a certain chemical ways of sealing that up in the histone or that DNA sequence on the histone so it doesn't get reproduced. One way that it does that is through DNA methylation. And let's talk about sort of the three big categories that we'll talk about today about epigenetics. These are the factors that allow the cell to decide which way to go, decide which protein or which genes to read. One is DNA methylation. The other one is histone modification. And the last category are non-coding RNA. The non-coding RNA are sort of different from the other two. Let's talk about DNA methylation and histone modification as ways to prevent genes from being expressed. It's a way to suppress, largely, it's a way to suppress genes being rewritten and then ultimately produced. So the way it works is that we talked about the four nucleotides in DNA, A, G, C, and T. The C is cytosine. And it turns out that there's a protein that can methylate that cytosine. And what does methylate mean? It means literally adding a carbon and some hydrogens onto a specific point on that cytosine. And when it does that, it basically mucks up the system. It does it in just, it's like a little, almost like a door wedge. You stick the little door wedge in the door and now the door can't close. You just stick it right there. It's tiny. It's like a little pebble in your shoe. It's small, but it's going to make you hobbled. So what we're doing is we're finding these little these cytosines, we're methylating them, and as a result, we're blocking that gene from being expressed. So again, 75% of the genes in your cells, in your terminally differentiated cells, are never expressed. And they're blocked away in part because the cytosines are being methylated. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Essentially, we're locking that section down, blocking the polymerase protein from being able to come by and read that sequence. So essentially we're gluing a couple of pages together with the DNA methylation on the cytosine spot. Exactly. Now, it's really interesting because you would think that given 3 billion base pairs in your DNA, that there's approximately the same number of A's, G's, C's, and T's. How they're organized is the code, but it's like reading, opening a book and saying, how many times does the letter A show up? Well, the letter A is going to show up a certain number of times, and it's going to be on average, I don't know if it's one out of 26, it's probably more than that because it's an A, not a Z. But at the end of the day, you'd expect a certain percentage. It turns out that mathematically, you would expect then AT or AC or AG to show up equally number of times, one sixteenth of the time, because now you got two of them, one, you know, one out of four for the first, one out of four for the second, one out of 16. Turns out that's not the case. It turns out that C followed by a G 
is very rare. And the reason is that's the site where that protein will bind that methyl group onto the cytosine. So you have these CG pairings where methylation occurs, CG in sequence. And so what we find is that if you look at DNA, you look at genes, you look at other areas, there's not a lot of Cs and Gs next to one another, except there's very special islands. They call them islands, CG or CPG, but CPG islands within your DNA, typically very close to that promoter sequence. And these CPG islands sit there and that's where the methylation occurs. So when you methylate that CPG, that methylation then is the glue or the pebble. Yes, you want to read it, but you can't because even though the promoter sequence is there and the promoter is saying, yeah, yeah, produce this sequence, even though the DNA has been released from the histones and it's sitting out there waiting to be produced, the methylation state says, nope, I'm inhibiting it. I'm not letting it happen. Okay, so that's one way that your individual cells, as they become differentiated, change which proteins they're making. I found this fascinating when I first learned about it years ago because it explained to me how one cell could be different from another. I said, how are these things differentiating? They have the same genes. How are they knowing which ones to produce? Well, this is a part of how this happens. It's one piece of it. Another piece, which is sort of downstream from reading of the DNA, is how it even gets exposed in the first place. Remember, we said DNA in that chromatin state is bound up around histones. And these histones are like spools of thread holding the DNA in place. They unwind when we decide we want to produce that gene. Again, how do we know which areas of the genome to unwind? Well, one way, we've got proteins that come along and read it and say, okay, this section needs to be unwound now. We need this section to be read. But we can modify the histone protein. And when we modify the histone protein, then you can unwind it. It's sort of like putting, again, it's like putting that little wedge in the door. It's not going to unwind. And if I can't unwind it, I can't open it up and read it. And so DNA methylation is one way of blocking the rewriting of it. The other way is by histone modification. You can either acylate it or you can acetylate it or whatever, how you want to say it, or methylate it, in which case it's, again, it won't unwind. It actually becomes tighter. It actually binds even tighter. So these are two ways to prevent the rewriting process. And it's really important to understand that if that gets dysregulated, if you do things that overmethylate or undermethylate, you can have problems. Undermethylation is associated with cancers. I mean, cancers, we talk about unregulated growth. It's almost like the cells de-differentiate. They become sort of anything and they're doing anything. Well, that's because they're not methylated properly. And so there's a whole group of oncologists who are looking at ways of modulating DNA methylation to treat cancer. Same thing with histone modification. Is it possible to methylate or acetylate those histones in a way that prevents them from being dysregulated in cancer? On the other side, when you overmethylate, you stop being able to produce proteins that your cell does need. And that is part of aging. And so if you overmethylate certain areas of the DNA, and it goes both ways because there's some level of aging where you lose methylation and can lead to cancer and dysregulation. But the other side of it is you have too much methylation and now you can't produce things that you need and it can be damaging or even deadly to the cell. So that's how epigenetics affects the rewriting of the DNA into RNA. The question comes up from a functional standpoint or from that like why standpoint is we ideally want to be in this bell curve type of situation where methylation is happening effectively most of the time within kind of a bell curve situation. But when it's happening too much or too little, we go out into those sides where the processes can lead to a cancerous type of situation or they can lead to speeding up the aging process. And we don't want to go down either of those two areas. We would ideally like to be in the middle. So what are the factors then, lifestyle factors, the things that we can actively do to ensure or try to keep that methylation occurring within the tall part of that bell curve? So 
you want your metabolism to be functioning as well as possible. So we've talked to other podcasts about ways that you can enhance energy production and, and keep your mitochondria healthy, et cetera. Those are really important things. But I think it's the same things that we talk about really all the time. You want your diet to be positive. You want your diet to be as clean as possible. And the reason for that is there's toxins in the food. There's inflammation that occurs. Inflammation is a big trigger for methylation changes and dysregulation. That's why inflammation is associated with everything from aging. There's inflammaging and inflammation is a big part of cancer. So inflammation is pushing you out of the bell curve, that peak of the bell curve where you want to be out into those extremes. You know, where else have we seen that? We've seen that in your autonomic nervous system. We often talk about the fact that when you're sympathetically activated, when you're in that fight or flight mode, when you're dealing with an emergency, you're pushing yourself out of homeostasis. You're leaving the bell curve, the peak of the bell curve, and you're pushing yourself to the outer extents of what your autonomic nervous system is really functioning and capable of doing, and your body's capable of doing. That can exist on the fight or flight side. Um, we talk about fight or flight a lot. We probably should really also talk about freeze. And freeze is the other side of the bell curve. So when you're pushing out to the extremes, on one end, you've got fight or flight. On the other end, you've got freeze and panic and you know frozen by terror. Those two extremes of the bell curve in the autonomic nervous system, are the parallel is with the immune system. You want to be in homeostasis. You want to be in that peak of the bell curve towards that center. You know, And then when you get into either cancer or autoimmune disease, you sort of have those two extremes where you're not doing what you're supposed to be doing and things start to break down. Turns out the same thing is true with DNA, with your genetic code. You want to be in that peak of the curve where you're aging. Yes, we can't really stop that, but you can do it as slowly as possible because everything's methylated properly. All the histones are functioning properly, some of which are altered and modified to, you know, to prevent genes that you don't need to be expressed anymore being expressed. But the moment that gets dysregulated, again, dysregulated by inflammation, dysregulated by sympathetic activation, it pushes you out of that homeostatic state into the danger zone. Sometimes you need to be there temporarily, but you want to be able to shift back as quickly as possible into the proper state. So there might be extreme situations in the environment, extreme circumstances that you've encountered where you do need to the, break from the norm, demethylate an area of, of DNA, change the, you know, modify the histones so that you can access that gene. And there's mechanisms in the cell for doing that. But by and large, you want to be able to get back to that state in a way that doesn't end up leading to cancer or leading to autoimmune disease and stress and depression and et cetera. So getting back to your question, what are things you can do? Exercise, eat right, sleep right. A lot of what happens during sleep is cleaning up, you know, cleaning up and getting back to that homeostatic state, debris clearance and removal of toxins, et cetera, all happen during sleep. So it's really important. Interestingly, socialization, being around other people has a remarkable, I don't think we've really scientifically decoded it as well as some people might want, self-included. I'd love to really know what the mechanisms are, but when you're around other people socially and enjoying time with other people, it's a key to a happy life. And we know that, and we've known that for 10,000 years, um, if not more, but understanding that it, there's something more than just folksy about that, there's something fundamental about that. And so again, those are key things that I like to talk about. I know you have a few others that you like to talk about as well, gut microbiome and being one. <laughs> Yeah, and, and all of these that we talk about are essentially pointing to the same thing, right? We're talking about limiting the things that trigger inflammatory reactions from occurring, doing our best to control the inflammatory process. And that's what I think it all comes down to is with regards to going down that inflammaging pathway or the inflammatory pathway towards cancers or autoimmunity or whatever, it's the lack of control of the inflammatory process and short bursts of inflammation are necessary. A car can't, a car is useless if you don't have an accelerator, right? It, you can't go anywhere. You can't do anything, but you need to have brakes because a car without brakes is dangerous. 
in the same way, a car without an accelerator is useless. So you need to be able to shift between sympathetic and parasympathetic, but it's a control of the sympathetic activation, a control of that accelerator by the use of the brakes that's necessary. And what often happens is we get too much on one side or the other. We're just pushing that accelerator and there's too many factors or too many weights being put onto the foot that's then pushing the accelerator versus the brake. And so we try to push the brake and the brake wears out. And that's where the parasympathetic nervous system starts to wear away. The vagus tone, vagal nerve tone goes away because the inflammatory challenges are so high. So the key here is what are the things that we can do to push us or to take those weights off the sympathetic activity, go back to parasympathetic where the inflammation can be controlled so we don't go down those paths. And that's where all of the particular, like the specific things that you brought up here, the practical implications of exercise, clean diet, movement, sleep, et cetera, all of those are necessary to be top of the line kind of things that we're all doing as fundamental daily practices. For sure. And we're going to get to it shortly because I, I want to make sure we get to the other piece of epigenetics of first, but we're going to talk about how vagus nerve stimulation and exercise and sleep all change methylation states, change histone modification states. And the, the other piece of it is non-coding sections of RNA. So one of the things you know, switching gears now, when you talk about DNA, we talk about the 3 billion base pairs. We talk about how it's folded up on itself into chromosomes and forming that chromatin structure. It turns out that only about 1% to 2% of DNA is actually coding for genes. The other 98 to 99% of the DNA used to be thought of as being sort of garbage. Um, they refer to them as exons versus introns. You know, exons were just large stretches of DNA that didn't matter. Then we found out, oh, no, no, at the very ends of the chromosomes, there's sections that are important for the recreation of the DNA, sort of structurally, we call those telomeres. And we found out that when telomeres shrink, you start, you see aging. Then there's structures where the X meets of the structure of the chromosome, where they cross. There's some structures in there about DNA that are important for maintaining the structure. But there's still... 80, 90% of the DNA that we didn't really understand its purpose. It turns out that they're filled with sections of DNA that are coding for what are called non-coding RNAs. Now, we're all familiar, or many people are familiar with the fact that there's transfer RNAs. Transfer RNAs are used to bring those amino acids to the ribosomes. So during the production process, where you take that RNA sequence that codes and you're turning it into a protein, there's tRNAs, transfer RNAs, but they're a tiny little bit of non-coding RNA. Most of the non-coding RNA comes in one of three flavors. There are what are called micro RNAs, and then a close cousin of theirs is called, it's a weird name, it's called peewee interfering RNAs, and then you have what are called small interfering RNAs. They all do very similar things, and here's how I describe it. I think it, it'll be easy to understand that as you are reading that DNA gene, there's a code. When you're reading the gene, it's producing the messenger RNA, the RNA that's going to be used to code for that protein manufacturer. But there's other sections in the DNA that have a similar code, or in many cases, a complementary code. And what happens is your polymerase will create not only the messenger RNA that's going to be used to create the protein, but it will also create small sections of RNA that will fold in on themselves and then get in a really cool process, multi-step process. They fold in on themselves. They almost look like, like a hairpin or, or a clothespin. And then there's other proteins that come off and clip sections off it. And at the end of this process that happens is you get a small section of RNA that in the case of microRNA is usually somewhere around 22 base pairs long. In some cases with interfering RNA, it's a little bit longer. It could be 26, 28, 29 base pairs long, but it's this or pair, nucleotides long. It's not a base pair, it's not paired long. And then similarly with the PUE interfering RNA, it's similar in the size, but you get this section of RNA that's only you know 20 to 30 nucleotides long, but it fits it sits perfectly on top of 
and binds to the RNA that's supposed to be used to make a protein. So let's imagine a situation where the cell does not want protein X made. It does not need it. It's not something that it wants right now, but it's part of the complement of DNA that's not blocked in by methylation or by histone modification. So that gene is gonna get transcribed. We're gonna copy it, okay? Because it's part of the normal copying process, okay, for that cell. Now it gets copied, but the cell says, I don't really wanna make it. I don't really wanna make very much of that, or I don't wanna make any of it. So it simultaneously produces the non-coding RNA that's gonna to bind to it. And so it gets carried out of the cell along with that messenger RNA, you get the non-coding RNA that comes along with it. And what happens is as that gene, as that RNA gets attached to the ribosome and the ribosome starts making that protein, all of a sudden you have this micro RNA or interfering RNA, small interfering or peewee interfering RNA that binds to that RNA sequence and the ribosome can't do it. It's now blocked. It's again, it's like trying to feed too much paper into a shredder. If you're doing one piece of paper at a time, it'll work. You put a whole sheaf of paper in there, it'll stop. And the whole thing grinds to a halt. And there's a whole bunch of proteins that are designed to recognize when this happens and to just digest everything away and start over. It's like a reset button for it. So again, if I sort of think about the epigenetic factors that we've discussed, we've got the DNA methylation, which gums up the rewriting process. We've got histone modification, which prevents the gene from even being exposed on the DNA. So it can't be transcribed or it can't be copied. And then you've got these interfering RNAs, these small non-coding RNA, that even though the gene has been transcribed, it's been copied, now it blocks the production process. So all three of these are ways that cells can regulate the amount of protein that it's made, even though it's terminally differentiated down to that one point where it's a hepatocyte, it's going to produce all the hepatocyte proteins that it could ever need. But now it regulates whether or not they're actually being produced into proteins based on those three epigenetic factors, which is, you know, I think it's fascinating how the complexity allows every individual cell in your body to be different and you to be entirely different, even if you had an identical genetic twin, you could be an entirely, not just different person personality-wise, or how your brain functions, or because you got a scar on your leg from an injury, your cells are literally functioning differently because of every environmental factor, internal and external. You're a totally separate person. Yeah, you can have an exact photocopy of two books, and those two books get read in different ways get essentially in made into two very different movies, right? Or two very different end products that we're talking about here. And it's very interesting to hear about these three different mechanisms of checks and balances that are present to A, stop the coding process from occurring at the DNA level and the DNA methylation, the histone modification piece. But then we also have this checks and balance section outside once the RNA is created to gum up the ribosome and say, we don't need to produce this because we aren't in a situation where we require this protein to be present. And so we've got all these different areas of checks and balances that are going to be very different in each person. And this is where epigenetics plays a really important role because that, I believe, epigenetics and the lifestyle factors, the things that are happening in and around us on an environmental level are driving those three processes which are then dictating which genes are A, being transcribed, and B, which proteins are being coded for. And the fascinating piece of this, which brings us back all the way to the beginning, is that when your cells start producing certain microRNAs or non-coding RNAs that are interfering with the producing process, making these proteins, those exist. And there's, for extended periods of time, there's actually mechanisms that reproduce those and make certain that you're maintaining the production of those microRNAs for an extended period of time. They amplify that microRNA expression and it's inheritable. So what happens is you have a person who's experienced something early in life. They're in a famine stricken area. So they, there's not a lot of food 
they're thin, they're frail, their cells have adapted to that level of food so that they can still thrive. And, but it's doing that by changing which genes are being expressed, how those genes are being expressed, which proteins need to be made. And they're doing that through this epigenetic process that changes every cell in that person's body. Well, that includes reproduction. And so, especially for women, it's less so for men because there's a complete reset of a lot of the methylation state, depending on, because of course, at conception, the cell has to be able to produce all the different proteins. But with respect to microRNAs and other things, there's an inheritance of that. And you end up with that next generation better prepared to live in that environment. So you can imagine, let's say you grow up, let's say you were born in 1915, okay? Life is great. You know, you're in the roaring 20s. You're, you know, five years old, 10 years old, 15 years old. Then the Great Depression hits, okay? You were living high on the hog. You were eating, you were a plump little kid. You were, you know, everything was wonderful. Now all of a sudden there's famine, there's economic hardship. You drop weight. You're not getting a lot of food. You're living in a difficult environment. Your cells are changing the amount of these methylation state, amount of miRNAs that are being produced, et cetera. Now you're 25 years old and you're in the middle of the Great Depression. Now you have a kid. Well, that kid is going to be given all of that structure that you have learned through your existence. And at that time, there's going to be a production or a, a state that is now more adapted to that lean environment that you're living in, that hardship-induced environment. That could not just be physiological in terms of being able to thrive in less food or anything like that, but it's it goes to mood. It goes to possibly work ethic. I, I mean, there's all sorts of things that are mental and emotional that are affected by this as well. So you can see how the experiences of the parent can be translated to the child. Now, let's say that child has a child and they lived through, yeah, the Great Depression. Then they lived through World War II and they lived through, you know, the early stages of the, you know, of the Korean War, et cetera. And now they're having a kid. Maybe they're going to pass on the same kind of, you know, there's a need for that same environment. But now that kid, that kid's going to grow up in the 50s, into the 60s, into the 70s, you know, lots of increasing wealth and increasing supply of food, increasing distraction and luxuries, et cetera. Well, they're not going to need those same tools. They're not going to need those same genetic changes and epigenetic changes that allowed those prior generations to thrive despite hardship. They're going to lose those and they're going to lose them because they don't need them. Now, it's possible that later on, maybe, you know, maybe 20 years from now, we're in another world war, God forbid, but you'll have a couple generations that are living without those protections. They're living with a different set of miRNAs that enable them to thrive, you know, and prevent metabolic disease or something like that. And it rotates. So this epigenetic factors is inherited, but it only lasts for a, as long as it's needed, if you will. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. And I believe I've heard from a few different podcasts and read a few research articles showing that these generational passages of epigenetic materials and epigenetic kind of specific transcription style factors are generally around for about two to four generations at maximum, and then they start to kind of dissipate or go away. So they are in the grand scheme of things, short-lived, but they are obviously going to affect a few generations down the line. And this is where kind of the generational trauma or the generational experiences, generational lived experiences get passed on for a few generations following and why some people will experience things in a certain way because their grandparents or great-grandparents had a specific experience with, for example, the Great Depression or whatnot, right? Or lived through a war, etc. And we still have some of those factors that can push us towards a more sympathetically activated state or more inflammatory state and can trigger potentially if there are genetic variable conditions, then passage down those particular conditions as well. Sure. And you know, and the question then pops into somebody's 
head, okay, well, sometimes those things are positives and sometimes they're negatives, even though they provided a survival advantage at one time, times change, now they're not appropriate. So how do we adjust for that? So, you know, and I'm not saying it's the only reason because there's certainly plenty of reasons, but there's an epidemic right now of metabolic syndrome in the United States and frankly, around the world and most of the Western world. Question is, how much of that is due to things like things that we're putting into our food, a more sedentary lifestyle. Obviously, those are very important factors, not enough exercise, et cetera. But there's got to be some level to which perhaps there's an epigenetic phenomenon going on because we've shifted out of uh, that period from the Great Depression through you know the Korean War, where there was an epigenetic need for maybe a different metabolism. And now that we're, you know, 50 years hence, 75 years hence, perhaps maybe our children and our children's children won't have that predisposition to metabolic disease, which we have as a result of the fact that parents and grandparents lived through hardship where certain epigenetic factors. I'm blue skying here. I'm using this as an example. I'm not saying for certain that that's the case, but it's a reasonable hypothesis based on how this thing functions, how these systems function. But the question is, okay, how can we adjust back to that central harmonious homeostatic state of methylation, of histone modification, and making certain that the right miRNAs are being produced, the right PWE interfering RNAs are being produced, the right short interfering RNAs are being produced. And it turns out that as we talked about before, exercise, diet, sleep, and relaxation, meditation, these things, they have an effect on these states, on DNA methylation, on histone modification, and on the interfering RNAs. And it's been studied, and we're seeing now papers starting really in the 2013, 2015 timeframe is when you started seeing some really interesting stuff come out. And it's going on right now. These studies are going on right now showing, for example, we talk a lot about vagus nerve stimulation. They're now realizing that this cholinergic anti-inflammatory pathway that we talk about. So vagus nerve stimulation causes the release of acetylcholine. Acetylcholine binds to immune cells at multiple locations, but primarily at the alpha-7 nicotinic acetylcholine receptor on the surface, multiple pathways, all of which suppress the expression of inflammatory cytokine genes. Well, how is it doing that? Well, there's direct pathways about transcription factors, et cetera. They're not binding to the promoter region, but it turns out that there's also miRNAs. There's also histone modification. There's also DNA methylation changes that take place as a result of it, which brings epigenetics into the mix. So it turns out that Again, I always like to say, when you trigger a pathway in the body, it's seldom that it's only one pathway. Mm -hmm. There's usually compensatory pathways and parallel pathways and you know, supportive pathways, all of which are driving that one outcome. It turns out that this is one of the most powerful because it not only has extracellular pathways that are protein-based, it also has epigenetic pathways and we've talked also about the fact that it has direct pathways into the mitochondria and energy pathways. So this pathway of vagus nerve stimulation and activation of the parasympathetic is remarkably potent. It has effects that are consistently positive and promoting homeostasis, promoting that housekeeping, middle of the bell curve kind of state that we all wanna be in, slowing down aging, enhancing cognitive function, enhancing metabolic efficiency and lowering inflammation across the board. It, it's a positive thing that we want to promote. Yeah, we've talked a lot about this, but essentially all of these practices, all of these regulatory things that we can do from a self-care perspective, from coming down after exercise to sleeping well, to eating a clean, relatively balanced diet, low inflammatory processes, are all linked to ensuring that the vagus nerve is working well or not under too much stress. That the brakes don't have to contend with the constant pushing of the accelerator. 
And that's what the vagus nerve is, is literally it's the brakes, the brake pads of the car in this analogy. And being at the big part of that bell curve means the majority of the time being able to bring ourselves from those endpoints of that bell curve from the two sides or the areas we don't want to be too often back into that regulated state, parasympathetic state, acetylcholine producing, sharing, calm, regulatory state, rest, digest, recover, repair, housekeeping, etc. And that's necessary for the entire regulation of not only the physiological processes that are occurring around us to control inflammation, but also what those inflammatory processes could lead to, which is changes in DNA methylation, changes in histone modification, changes in the presence of those non-coding RNAs that are going to allow for proteins to be produced that shouldn't be, right? And when we don't have control, we don't have the ability to limit the damage that can occur when we're in that sympathetic state. And so the damage and the challenge becomes something that we can't contend with. That leads to disease states. And that's where the process then leads to being diagnosed with X condition or Y condition that will lead to a decrease in your longevity, decrease in your health span, et cetera. That's what we want to avoid. So we know that it's the vagus nerve and the activation of that parasympathetic nervous system that regulates and maintains us in the big part of that bell curve where health and happiness and homeostasis occur most of the time. And what we want to do is have those practices in place that maintain that autonomic balance, that maintain that parasympathetic function at the highest potential that it can be. And in a lot of cases, people are at those extremes already. And how do we help bring them back? Well, these practices you mentioned, deep breathing exercises, meditation, exercise, et cetera, those are great and they're foundational, but for some people it's too late to get those things started. And this is where vagus nerve stimulation can really stake its claim and say, this is where we can do better. This is where we can really ramp up the production of those brake pads, get us back into that regulated state. I think this is where vagus nerve stimulation comes in and really helps to pull in and reel in people that have gone a little bit far off those deep ends. And even those that are just kind of on the fringes really helps to bring them closer to that center point of balance that we want to be in. Yeah. And I think that we're all, given the Western society, we're all living probably not at the at the perfect center. We're living pretty far off from the center. And hopefully for most of us, it's not going to be too short, or too long a trip to get back to the center. But I think this is a, a great time to talk about the fact that most people, when they're given a vagus nerve stimulator, it's because they're experiencing some problem. They're experiencing some issue that the vagus nerve stimulation will help them get back to a healthier state. But I want to really drive home the point that we're making right now, which is you need that resilience all the time. So even if you're the healthiest person that you know, there's no reason why you couldn't be more healthy and more resilient and more capable of handling stress. We've talked a few times, not as many times as we probably should, about Wim Hof and his ability to literally be injected with what would be for you or me, lethal doses of LPS or inflammatory things. And just simply by regulating his breathing, he's trained so well to regulate his breathing to regulate his autonomic nervous system, to regulate his immune system through that, he's capable of surviving and actually not even experiencing ill consequences of what would be for many people, you know, lethal or if not lethal, certainly very uncomfortable sickness. And so I'm not saying Wim Hof, I think even Wim Hof could benefit from this, but I think Wim Hof is an example of a person who recognizes that no matter how healthy you are, using your vagus nerve to maintain that state at all times, because the environment's going to constantly try to push you, especially in Western society, it's going to try to push you off that center point and out to the fringes. We want to bring yourself back to that center, you know, as often and as effectively as possible. And, you know, you can do two hours of meditation. I wholly suggest doing yoga, meditation, eating right, exercising, all of those things. But to the extent that you can't, 
or that your life just doesn't permit you to do that because of travel, because of kids' demands, because of work, et cetera, you can get a lot of the benefit, a lot of the benefit of those things you can get simply by very rapidly using an electrical stimulator, whether it be on the ear, on the neck. I mean, I'm not suggesting people go out and get implantable devices put in, but you can certainly benefit from it, even if you consider yourself healthy. I think if you're healthy, wonderful, be more healthy, you know, and isn't it worth two minutes, you know, five minutes, whatever it takes. I mean, you're going to spend that much time standing in the line at Starbucks. While you're standing in the line at Starbucks, you know, put your earbud in, put the device on your neck, do what you need to do in order to stimulate your vagus nerve. And it will make yourself emotionally, mentally, and physically more resilient. And that's the key. I think building up that resilience, being able to handle those stressors because those stressors are going to hit us at any point during our lives. We're going to have a lot of them. And so building resilience is truly the key to being able to handle those stressors and being able to thrive in the world that we live in today. And I don't think there's any other area that we need to really go into. You've got a point there. So I was just going to say, and each one of those things, those stressors, those environmental factors, they're affecting you genetically through these epigenetic factors. We know that vagus nerve stimulation, exercise, parasympathetic activation are all things that help to minimize the damaging effects of those epigenetic factors. And so just yet one more way in which you know, we are promoting parasympathetic activation, vagus nerve stimulation for health. I 100% concur. And I think this is a great way to end our conversation for today. So I'm very, very happy if you made it to this point in the podcast. It was full of science, but also full of wonderful practical life skills and tools that we can all utilize. And I would love it if you would share this episode with one person that you feel could really use this information to upgrade their health. Uh, we'll catch you on the next one. Have yourself a wonderful upgraded day. Mm-hmm.